Welcome to another episode of Car Stories by Sung Kang and Amelia Hartford. Today we had Magnus Walker, who is a legend in the car space. And a real personal inspiration for myself, you know, mm-hmm. so someone who inspired me to have the courage to jump into the community and not worry about what other people are thinking, mm-hmm. you know, and that. A spiritual person, but also a hard worker. And hey, you know, nothing's going to get handed to you. You have to work for what you want in life and give it your all, which I respect. Yeah. And I think you guys are going to hear a side to Magnus that you never knew Mm -hmm. that he had because this is a multi-dimensional person with many layers and many, many wise things to share, which today we touched upon. And I, I know I'll walk away with a lot of great, great, you know, tools in my, you know, box now absolutely right and i i hope people listening have that same takeaway yeah i'm sure they will yeah Yeah. i believe it how do you two know each other how do we know each other well i met you through fraser at e garage when we shot a video called furious outlaws where we swapped cars yeah Mm -hmm. sung drove 277 and i drove the faguzi fagazi remember i couldn't pronounce Mm -hmm. it for blue is yeah Yeah. oh really yes we never actually talk about that, but I yeah, that, 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 that did happen. <laughs> that, that actually did because happen. Because I don't know how to drive a Porsche, especially. And, that and actually it's like, did happen. <laughs> and he was so like calm about it. I was like, uh, he's going to get freaking pissed, right? And uh, But Magnus was so zen. You know, I did blow his engine. Yeah. Well, thankfully, we finished the shoot, and it was on the way down the hill. And I remember, like, it went, and I just remember pulling into the bottom pull-in where we pushed it into the spot yeah. for the ending scene, and then towed it home. So that was how we met. And I think that was actually twenty. I should have looked it up, but I think it was twenty sixteen. I was thinking about it this morning because I was really, you know, looking forward to you know seeing you again, and um. I was like, so what does Magnus mean to me? And I don't think I, I I think I told you this, but I always tell people this, is that Magnus is the reason I'm here or sitting here right now with you, Amelia, because Magnus's TED Talk, I don't know if you had the privilege of listening to this, but I think it's like nine years old. 2014, it's actually coming up on its 10 year anniversary. 10 years. Wow. And I remember I used to listen to TED Talk and I had, discovered Magnus's TED Talk and it moved me so much, right? And you need to listen to this. Like it, it gave me the courage to go, just go and do it. Go go get into the car community. Cause I was like, hey man, you're just this actor from the fast movies. You can't like do that. You can't like, like, you know, pursue passion. Like, you know, I always had interest in cars, but I'm not a mechanic. I'm not a race car driver, but I'm like, I don't want to. I have. I don't I have this imposter syndrome thing. It's like I don't want to be a poser. It's like, but you know, after I listened to Magnus, it was the first person within the car community that actually I could understand, and mm. it, his message resonated. It wasn't about, you know, I was a racer, and I'm. You got to be a racer. You got to be a mechanic. Go to mechanic school. It's like, the life lesson of like just be passionate about what you're doing. Be open minded. These, these doors open and you never know what opportunities, what kind of people are you right. gonna meet, you know? And it's one of the most important TED Talks, mm. I think, at least for me in my life and then for people in the car community, it's like a must listen. You know? Well, thank you for sharing that. The ironic thing about the TED Talk is I'd never even heard of TED Talks when they approached me to do one. Wow. And they'd, I got approached and they'd seen the Urban Outlaw short documentary film that came out late October, 2012. In early 2014, they approached me to do a TED Talk. And I'm like, what's a TED Talk? I didn't even know what one was. I hadn't even watched it. And long story short, you know, I told my story a few times. So I I was pretty comfortable telling my story. But it was in an environment where people edited my story. So doing a TED Talk, you have 18 minutes and it's live. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was out of my comfort zone. I left school at 15 with not a lot of education. I did my TED Talk at UCLA on a big stage in front of a thousand people and I had to sit through probably a dozen TED Talks before I went up and I was pretty intimidated because these people were talking about what I thought was important stuff that I didn't actually understand and I'm just going up there talking about go with your gut and do what feels right. And so, you know, I was pretty nervous but the TED Talk taught me how to get to the point quicker and actually how to be more comfortable in a public environment where you can't say, okay, stop, let me redo that again. 
it was live. So it, it, I sort of benefited from that. And the ironic thing with the TED Talk is it's the most viewed thing I've done. Mm. It's got over almost 10 million viewers last time I looked or was aware of it. And I would say 95% of the people that have watched it had no idea who I am and are not car people. But the message which you so eloquently put transcends the car generation or the car community of just do what you love to do. Yeah. And I've got more feedback and emails from people that watched the TED Talk that said it inspired them and motivated them to go do something that they were pretty much intimidated by. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people have gone down this path of going down a career that they thought they had to do because their parents did it, doctor, mm -hmm. lawyer, something like that. But they weren't really happy in that environment. And really what they wanted to do was be a skater or a surfer or a car guy or make candles or whatever it was. And somehow there was a spark of motivation through the TED Talk that I did that it was kind of like, oh, I should follow my passion, follow my gut, and just do what I love to do. And that's always sort of been my thing. And I think you summed it up really well of, you know, you sort of don't necessarily have to worry about what other people think a lot of the time and just do what makes you happy, what drives you, and what motivates you. So that was the story behind the TED Talk. So uh, thanks for sharing that. I mean, your story will parallel a lot with it. You know, I think, you know, the generation or the... The, the fan base that you inspire you mm -hmm. know, is gravitating towards you because probably very similar things of what you know Magnus represents mm -hmm. for old people like me. <laughs> right? mm -hmm. so. My story was pretty <laughs> common. You know, I, I, I've been fortunate enough to travel and I've heard people tell similar stories. You know, you grow up as a kid, everything starts at a young age with a toy model, right? Whatever your car of choice may be. Mine just happened to be Porsche, but I've heard similar stories about people had their poster on the wall, followed their passion, you know, built their first car, which might've been handed down from a family member or some emotional connection. It's always an emotional connection I feel to the car, which brings back what I call memorable moments. Your first drive with your dad or the first car you learned to drive in or the first drive with your girlfriend or whatever it may be. So that's kind of a common bond that I think people can relate to because it's like, oh yeah, that was me. I had a poster on the wall. So I, th I think that's sort of what attracts people to that TED Talk once they hear it and they go back to it is, you know, it's, they relate to it. It's a relatable story. Mm. So that's kind of my story on the TED Talk. You know, Magnus, this is something I always wanted to ask you, and I think probably people in the car community would never guess this, right? And um, you used to be a cross-country runner. Yeah, I Can did. You, I mean, you, no one would ever guess this was an athlete. This was like a competitive. Like, long, I'm not surprised to hear it, though, because well, uh, he's a highly impressive person. Yeah, because that's, <laughs> that's no joke to be a competitive cross-country runner. It's a big deal. right? Like, yeah, I, I mean, for me, I, I always describe myself as a lone wolf in the sense of I'm not necessarily a team sport player. Like, I didn't play a team sport. And cross-country running is an individual sport. I was a middle-distance runner, cross-country runner, and ironically, it started at a very young age, and it was back to passion. It was something I enjoyed doing, and it was something I was actually good at doing, and it was an activity that didn't, you don't need any, any uh, you don't need anything, just a pair of running shoes and shorts, and you go do it. Mm -hmm. You don't have to rely on someone else mm. in the sense of a team. So I started running at an early age, and I talk about this pivotal point for me that happened when I was 11 years old. This was 1978. And I, I'd i been running competitively and doing pretty well and ended up being North England schoolboy champion. And it, it was something I was passionate about and motivated me. And at the time, one of my heroes was this athlete called Sebastian Coe, who actually ran for this club that I ran for called the Hallam Harriers. He was probably five, six years older. And he, uh, he wrote this, I got a certificate, I finished third, and all he put was, well done, Seb Co. And I still have this thing, because he was an idol of mine that I looked up to, I had posters of him on the wall. And it just goes to show one word of encouragement, well, two words, well done. I'm still mm. talking about it, 40-odd mm. years later, 45 years later. And Sebastian Co. went on to be an Olympic champion in the 800 and 1500 meter uh, discipline and went on to be a world record holder in 1980, 1984, at the, Moscow, uh, the LA Olympic Games in 1984. So it was a significant thing for me that became what I call a teachable element where a little bit of confidence building doesn't really take a lot of effort. When, when people come up to me and say, you know, uh, they've watched my story, watched the film, been motivated by me, I always take time to sort of give back because I, I always revert myself back to 
Sebastian Coe signing the certificate saying, well done. And, you know, it was just one of those little things. So I always take time when people come up to me and have supported me in what I've done. And what I do is basically, you know, it's a hobby. It's not a business. The, the car thing's a hobby for me. So it's one of those teachable elements that came through being a middle distance runner, cross country runner. And looking back on my life, going back 45 years, I realized now, which I didn't realize at the time, that that discipline of running twice a day, five days a week, setting goals, being motivated mm -hmm. to achieve those goals, having a little bit of success at an early age sort of set me up for later on in life, mm. you know, to actually set a goal, be disciplined, motivated, work towards that, but put the effort in. You know, you don't necessarily need the experience or the talent. That sort of helps, but that develops and matures over time. Mm -hmm. You know, whatever it is you want to do in life, I believe if you put the energy in and put the effort in and be dedicated and don't give up. Yeah. The TED Talk sort of ties into this a little bit with this teachable element of a lot of people have great ideas, but they probably don't execute them because they've run it by a friend. I'm um, thinking about doing this thing. What do you think? The friend may be negative and say, oh, I don't think that's a good idea. That'll never work type of scenario. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people don't cross the start line. Mm. And he's sort of, well, you have to cross the start line. You know, so a lot of people sort of back away from, oh, the fear of failure. So I think for me, having that discipline as a young kid and then literally coming to America and L.A. as a 19-year-old, I worked on a summer camp with inner city underprivileged kids north of Detroit and took a trailways bus from Detroit to L.A. and arrived in L.A. This part of the story is pretty funny because I arrived in L.A. as a 19-year-old on a trailways bus from Detroit at Union Station. But I took a bus from Union Station and stayed at the YMCA just south of Hollywood Boulevard that I think is three blocks west of here. And that building is still there. So whenever I drive by it, I go, that was the first place I ever stayed in LA when I arrived in 1986, mm. which is 38 years ago. Mm. So I'm aging myself there. But I came with this dream. I grew up watching a lot of American TV, listening to American music. I was influenced by American culture. So arriving in Hollywood, it, it was weirdly anticlimactic because the Hollywood I'd seen on TV in the 80s when I arrived at Union Station on a Tuesday morning at 4 a.m. in the morning, I'm like, we're all the movie stars, we're all the rock stars, you know. Then I arrived to Hollywood and that was a really sort of wake up call on Hollywood Boulevard in the mid 80s. But I clicked with it and resonated with it. And every time I go past that YMCA, it's kind of a grounding thing for me because that was ground base zero mm -hmm. when I arrived here, not knowing anyone. Mm -hmm. And I'm still here, whatever it is, 38 years later. And LA is home to me. And I spent 19 years in Sheffield, England. But all my adult life has been LA. Like I, ne I never had a driver's license in England, never owned a car in England, never had my own apartment, never had a real job. I was just sort of bumming around. And so LA was the land of opportunity. It was everything I was into at the time and still is. It's still an inspiring place for me, LA. I, I get inspiration just, just walking around Hollywood. So ironically, Hannah and I bought a house up the road, less than a mile up the road from here, wow. uh, in near the Hollywood Bowl. It's a hundred year old Spanish house that we're restoring. That's cool. So I'm finding myself, you know, I never lived in Hollywood. I'd lived in Venice and downtown for 30 years, but I'd go to Hollywood, but now living here, I'm walking around all these places that bring back these memories of when I first arrived, and it's kind of an inspiring thing. Wow. Do you still have your, uh, what, would it, what would you call it, loft in downtown? The downtown? Yeah, yeah, I still have the I warehouse. I was going to ask about the that. Warehouse. You're not getting rid of it, are you? It's like no, a, it's I an mean, institution now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I've owned that. This will be the 24th year I've owned that building. Mm. I, I've been downtown in the Arts District since 1994. So in 2000, I bought a 26,000 square foot uh, building that was constructed in 1902. It's now 122 years old. So that was where I ran my clothing company. I lived in the loft. I accidentally fell into the film location business 20 years ago mm. by renting that space out for everything like commercial filming, TV shows, music videos, reality shows. And along the way, sort of housed my Porsche collection. Yeah, my dream is a warehouse similar to what you have. That's yeah. the high level goal one day. Well, you got to make the dream come true, you know, baby yeah. steps and take yeah. that leap of faith. Like you said, keep working at it. Yeah, you got to keep doing that. Have you always been a very motivated person? Yeah, I think so. You know, I describe myself as street smart. You know, I left yeah. school with two O levels at 15, went on the dole. But um, yeah, I think when I arrived in LA, 
I had to be motivated because I didn't know anyone and I didn't want to go back home. For me, failure would be returning to Sheffield, the city I came from. Mm. Not that it's a bad place, but everything sort of I'd grown up aspiring to be around was literally here in LA. I have no education in essentially the clothing, property development, and messing around with cars. It wasn't like I went to school to learn any of that, but I had an interest in it and a passion. And LA is one of those places where opportunity just sort of comes weirdly. You know, people say, you know, oh, you get lucky. I say you make your own luck mm -hmm. by being, put yourself in the right place at the right time. But when someone offers you that opportunity that may be scary to host a podcast, for example, right? Sure, do it. How bad can it be, right? I was asking myself, like, and I, so I went into this rabbit hole of like, why is Magnus Magnus? Like, how does he have that? And I use, you know, I use this phrase, like, the light behind his eyes, like the headlights are always on high beam where, mm -hmm. you know, I catch myself, the, the lights start to dim after a while for whatever factors, right? And I'm, I catch myself like, hey, 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 you gotta be careful. You better go get a jolt, you know, go get a jump somewhere. You gotta go. And I, I use running, you know, as in my daily life when things are really down and I feel like unmotivated or I feel like, you know, I feel like I'm making myself a victim to life and like, you know, discouragement. And you know, especially in our business of Hollywood, it's it's a business of no's. Like you're never good enough, right? So it's 99.9% .9 no. And you're waiting for that point one thing. And I, and so I started adopted, adopting running. Because Do you like running? I like it now as I'm older, because mm -hmm. before, you know, I because I was so competitive because I was younger. I was like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna run a marathon, and then I lose. I'm mm -hmm. not gonna win, right? And all these people are passing me. I'm Winning's like, finishing, though, yeah, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. And then yeah, now I, now I, like I have like these four hills that I run daily. It's like the, as soon as I wake up, like I mm -hmm. go, and it's the hardest thing to do because it's like it's all uphill. It's like I appreciate at age 51 mm -hmm. that first of all that I'm still able to do it there you yeah go. and I get up there and I've learned this thing called you know gratitude which I never had right and the I then the concept of even prayer right like in my travels I've gotten to meet very spiritual people and I was in Kyoto Japan which is like one of the most spiritual places in Asia and especially Japan and this car guy Mirasan, who you know, is Rocket Bunny. I don't know if you know Rocket Bunny. They make yeah, yeah. kids. Pandem now. Every time I go to visit him, we never do anything car related. He takes me straight to the temples. And he's like, and I, I feel like I have to take you here. And I'm like, to do what? He's like, it's a place where I give thanks mm -hmm. that I'm healthy enough to like come here, that I get to pursue this beautiful life of like making cars. I get to meet friends like you. I get to have kids. I have a wonderful wife and a wonderful son. So I just give thanks. And this is where I come and I do this every day. And he's like, Sung, do you have a place back in LA? And I go, no. He goes, well, maybe you need to find. Yeah. yeah. So on this run, like I found this place, which you, you know, you get up to the first stage. I could, there are four stages and the first stage you get and there's a little bench somebody made and I just go there and I, do these two claps that Mirasan taught me, and I pray, and I go, thank you for my wife, my life, thank you for this beautiful dog and the mm. other dog, thank you for this health, and that's about it. And then I go, thank you for today, I get to do a podcast with a couple of friends, and then I go on my way. Second stage is harder. Long, long journey right up this mountain. Third stage is even lonelier and colder. But then the fourth stage is back down the mountain going home. And I'm like, wow, it's not so bad, mm. right? And I use that as like a daily, like, you know, kind of discipline to go, hey, keep that, keep that light behind your eyes, like positive. And when I found out that you were a, you know, distance runner or a mid distance runner, I was like, that's the, that's the foundation of how you're able to keep the headlights bright in life, right? You know? Yeah, I, I think so. How many miles a day do you run? 
I think it's like a five mile okay. course. I used wow. to track everything, and then that would get in the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I go, oh, I didn't do twelve today, or I didn't do eighteen today. Right. There was a time where I was running like twenty-two miles. Wow. Like, so I, I called it forest gumping. Yeah, yeah, yeah. guys, I can't I even run, run a mile. Yeah. Keep running. <laughs> All right. I walk a lot. I, I no longer run. I haven't run in a long time, but um, I think once you get to a certain point in life, priorities shift. Things change. Things that were important before are not quite as important at a certain point, you know, and you start sort of thinking along the lines of what you were talking about, mm. you know, things to keep you grounded, but also motivated, keep the light on, mm. the passion burning bright. You know, my, my thing, you know, it's, it's 2024, right? So these New Year's resolutions and, you know, my thing is to continue doing what I call cool shit with cool people, but mm. collaborate and create more with other people mm. as opposed to being this sort of lone wolf where, you know, I'm a one man army doing stuff on myself, you know, because it is hard to stay motivated and actually, you know, continue to create things that you're proud of all the time. Mm. You know, I think life goes in this circle of highs and lows and, mm -hmm. you know, peaks and plateaus and you reach a certain level and then sidestep maybe take a different turn and see where that road goes. I'll never be a competitive like race car driver because I think about consequences like before I even get in the car. So there's going to mm -hmm. be this fear, or th yeah. like the fear. Like, yeah. I don't think you can get in the car with, with – you can get in the car with fear, but if you're thinking about what you just said – Consequences. Consequences. Yeah. It's kind of like I used to do a lot of track days from 2002 to 2008 and – I do 40, 50 a year. And I went through the program where you turn up with a street car, you do some time trial, and then you go next level, you get club race license, you're doing some wheel to wheel. But I'm still doing it in 277 streetable track car, not a mm. fully caged, dedicated race car, because I mm -hmm. like the idea of driving it to the track and back. And so you go down this slippery slope, I think you can probably relate to it, right? Where you just get in it, you get motivated. The time, the energy, the dedication, your craft gets better, you become a better driver. I started instructing. But then there became a point where the more competitive it became, you know, these three day events it become all consuming, prepping the car, you gotta travel there, it's a five day event, mm -hmm. the pressure builds, you're away from your regular and controlled environment. And for me, the more competitive it became, the less fun it became. Mm -hmm. And I, I said and I said to myself, I'm kind of done with this because I'm no longer 100% committed to doing this. And I, I realized if you're not 100% committed to being on the track, you don't go on the track. Because mm. that's when stuff goes wrong when you're not 100% committed. Or at mm. least from my point of view. It's like if there's a shadow mm. of doubt second-guessing yourself. Mm. I was no longer competitive. <laughs> I wonder if that 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 notion of not being 100% committed to something um, and th that's the reason why you l stop, I guess, tracking, right? I wonder if you can apply that to anything you want to be I successful think you can. in. Oh, yeah. I think everything. Yeah. Everything in life. If you're that's not going to give it your 100%. Right. Yeah. Back to you got to be committed. First of all, you got to believe in yourself and have confidence that you're going to be able to achieve this goal that you've set, whatever it may be running up the hill faster, going around a track faster or whatever. So I think you need that inner self-confidence and focus where you can block out the external negativity and noise that might distract you and derail you, first of all. But ultimately, I think whatever it is you're doing, whether you're making candles or surfing or whatever, you've got to be 100% committed to it. Otherwise, I don't think you give your all. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's the difference right there. Are you 100% are you committed to drag racing? Whenever I do something, I'm doing giving it a hundred and ten percent. I really don't half-ass things that I do, and it's that's why I never went in, or I haven't gone into a competitive racing series because of acting. And I cannot take on responsibility of racing and then book a role and know that I have to let down sponsors or I can't or I'll lose points because I can't race because then I'm not giving it my hundred and ten percent. I feel like everything I do, I have to give everything. So you're very selective on what you focus your energy on. Yeah. Were you always like that, or did, did you have to learn that? No. I mean, I, I wasn't, I wasn't. I, I was very competitive growing up, but I feel like 
when I was growing up, I wanted to do and try everything to get experience in everything. And I think once I solidified with the things in my life that I was most passionate about, that's when I had that shift happen of, okay, well, this is it. This is what I'm doing. I'm going to give it my all because we get one life on this earth. Um, I don't want to become older and be like, man, I should have tried a little harder. Yeah. You know? So it's okay to lose passion, right? Like, yeah, because I right? think generally what happens is, uh, you know, you'll find passion elsewhere. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. different opportunity. You know, I think you've got to be committed to what you're doing and you got to prioritize like if acting's more of a priority than drag racing is you follow that path until maybe acting's not quite as exciting or nurturing or you're not getting as much out of it or or you just feel like you need a break and you need to try something else yeah so you know i feel for me i never had a plan you know people talk mm. about where do you see yourself in especially at school where mm. do you see yourself in five years ten years twenty years I never had that plan, you know, and that sort of enabled me to really just go with the flow and then you get to a certain point, opportunity comes up and you go, yeah, that feels good. And it's like when we bought the building downtown, the warehouse, like in 2000. People thought we were crazy at the time for doing that, but it was the best thing we ever did. You know, I was able to house the cars, got into the film location business, ran a clothing company, and then the neighborhood came up around and now mm -hmm. the arts district is kind of like the new culver city the new venice it is so expensive you know, i was looking for shop space over there and oh my gosh it's yeah in, it wasn't like that yeah. 20 25 years ago you know it was just more of a industrial but i took a leap of faith bought this building restored this building and everything that i've been talking about since i walked through that door sort of happened through that building and to this day people still come into it and go wow there's a there's a good vibe here. It's been built up over 20 years, but there's some this soul there, you know, and, and I'm kind of a, I, I tap into that type of thing. Mm -hmm. You know, I have to sort of be grounded in an environment that I feel comfortable in that's creative. Like sometimes, you know, I'll go to car collections and people have got fancy great stuff, but I look at where it is and it's in some concrete tilt up and it's just a generic space. Mm. And to me, you know, Lack of character. Yeah. Uh, soul. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Soul, character, patina. You know, it, it all needs to be housed in this environment that reflects my personality. Like someone's got great flashy cars that they don't drive in a clinical industrial building. I go, this just doesn't, I'm, I'm not interested in that. Mm. Mm -hmm. Like when people want to show me cars that have no miles on it and they're proud of it because, you know, they don't drive it. I go, well kind of built to be driven right i'm more interested in show me the car with a million miles on it because that's got the stories and the memorable moments and the history and that's just more interesting mm -hmm. to me because you left fashion i mean that was a passion of yours cause yeah yeah there, right and then i mean how were you able to leave that like because it was such easy, a big pretty big part easy of your i life. mean i started selling secondhand clothing on the boardwalk in venice in the late 80s you know, I'd go to yard sales, buy Levi's for like 50 cents, cut up some shirts, sew some patches on it. It was a creative outlet for me. You know, and it was I, I was coming at it from this rock and roll, I guess, pseudo hippie thing. And then late 80s, early 90s, the rave scene took off and everyone was into sort of flower power and whimsical floppy hats. And it was just a whole movement. And that led into developing this clothing company called Sirius. Like I say, that was a rock and roll brand that I was passionate about. It was just, I didn't, my mum had taught me how to sew because at the time I tried to make my jeans as tight as possible and sew patches on my denim jacket so I could sew. So that was kind of a little skill set that I had. And it was just kind of easy to get into. And I realized back to like the running thing, once I had a little bit of success by making something that people actually appreciated and bought and generated some income so I was financially stable on my own, it was baby steps, but it was the same connection as the running. Uh, I talk about this a little bit sometimes. The three things that I've done in the past 40 years with no education, and I mentioned it earlier, was the clothing, property development, and cars. The common bond thread was I was passionate about it. Mm. So the clothing company, you know, I just liked what we were making. Other people liked it. It got into this rock and roll lifestyle, you know, opened up a lot of opportunities to work with bands, got some magazine coverage, you know, lots of magazine coverage. You know, bands would wear it, stars would come down and get it for videos. We were on the cover of Rolling Stone and all this stuff. And this all happened sort of, you know, 
way before the internet. This was 80s and 90s. You know, there was no thing as Instagram and Facebook and social media. And in a way, it was sort of easier when I look back then. You know, you weren't wasting time checking your phone and do people like this, not like it. It didn't matter. It was like, I liked it. We sold it. Other people liked it. Bands wore it. Move on. Just always evolving, not second guessing, not worrying about what other people think. So uh, to answer your question, I closed Sirius down in 2011 and probably two, three years before I was now in my early 40s, so I wasn't going out as much to clubs. I didn't really have to dress up and, you know, sort of, I just lost interest in it. I'd lost passion for it, you know. Mm. It had become sort of, didn't interest me, didn't motivate me. And the last couple of years of doing it was sort of treading water. Sales were dwindling, but all of our friends worked for the company and we just sort of gave them like six months notice of, hey, we're going to close this thing down. We didn't sell it. You know, we just sort of ended it. We just shipped all our orders and said, okay, we're done with that chapter of the life. And thankfully, the film location business was successful enough that it was paying the mortgage on the building. And then I didn't know what was going to come next. But I, like I say, the clothing company took a lot of time and energy to continually be on top of it because we, we designed and manufactured it. It wasn't like we just bought T-shirts and did screen prints. We actually did the whole thing. So it was a full-time operation, and when I closed that down, I had a lot of time and didn't know what was coming next. Back to this, I hadn't planned for life after running a clothing company. But what happened within six months was Timmy Moscovici's short documentary, Urban Outlaw, that put me on the map. And then the next sort of 10, 12 years from 2012, that film came out October 15, 2012, I got invited all around the world to go to events and travel and car-related stuff. And the point to my rambling here is if I was still running the clothing company, managing a business with employees, I would never have had the time to take advantage of these opportunities of mm -hmm. travel, meet people like Bob Ingram, go to Japan, hang out with Nakaya san all this cool stuff. You know, I ended up in Need for Speed video game and various other things. That just became my focus. But I hadn't planned it. Mm. But indirectly, I'd closed the door of the clothing company that was a 60-hour-a-week, all-consuming uh, gig. And then I had all the time in the world. And then when people started inviting me places to do things I was passionate about, nothing was holding me back. I had a passport, and you know, you could say to me today, hey, do you want to go somewhere on Friday? I'd be like, sure, I'll go. So sometimes you've got to take this leap of faith and not be so hemmed into this is where I, I need to be at this certain time with this rigid sort of sometimes restrictions on can't do this, can't do that. So mm -hmm. that was the ultimate freedom, being able to do whatever you wanted to do when you wanted to do it, mm -hmm. when the opportunity arose mm -hmm. in that sort of environment. So closing, clothing, uh, closing down serious clothing wasn't a hard decision. Mm -hmm. It was kind of like when we did it, we're like, we should have done this two years before. Mm -hmm. But in reality, if we'd done it two years before, Urban Outlaw wasn't out. Sure. So, well, and everything happens for a reason. And yeah. Time is the reason not everything happens at once. Right. And, and you've got to be patient and just let things evolve sometimes. Yeah. And I think it's true, too, that you need to create space in your life for, to allow new things to come in. Yeah, very much so. I've always wanted to ask you this question, especially these days. And, we, and, and if you're uncomfortable with, with it, we can actually cut this out, you know. Karen was your first wife. Correct. Right? Well, yeah. actually, she was. I was married before. She was my second the wife. Second but wife. I'd been with Karen for 21 years. And that's who you started the business with. Yeah, yeah. And you had a wonderful life with her. She had passed away. She has passed away. Correct. Right? So my question, it's a personal question, because, you know, my father, my stepfather, um, as of late, he's very unhealthy, right? And I guess, you know, everyone's preparing um, for him to leave us, right? And I do feel like it's going to rock me and my sister. And there's a lot of, like, regrets that I have that I'm trying to, like, sort out in my personal life with him, you know, because it wasn't always rosy with him. You know, if, for someone who's gone through this loss um, of someone that is, you know, important to you. Like, how do you not let those things dim your light? 
Magnus, because we're talking about all like these, uh, you know, like everything is very inspirational here. Like it's and to the listener, it could sound like, oh, everything was so nice, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, but you, bump in the road. you have to realize yeah. you're human, and yeah, it's not always nice, right? Yeah, and, uh, yeah. I mean, Karen passed away in 2015, and I met her in 1994. So we've been together 21 years, and we we built this thing together, the clothing company, and bought the building and. Karen's passing was a real shock that was not, didn't see it coming. It wasn't expected. wasn't expected. You know, it was, it was a terrible loss. And, you know, I had no time to plan for the inevitable. Mm. Like my father passed away in 2012, and I sort of had a turbulent relationship with my father because um, this will be a long answer to your question. But, but it, I think it, it, there'll be some relevance to it. You talked earlier on about me being a cross-country runner, and middle-distance runner, and I talked at some detail about having a certain amount of early success at that. And my father was there with me through that. And once I hit the age of, like, 14 in England, you can go to the pub, start drinking. I was going to rock and roll shows. I just stopped running. And it really hurt my dad. But being from England and Northern and in this 80s period, he couldn't communicate. You know, and it was like I talked about Sebco riding well done. I didn't talk about my dad patting me on the back and saying well done because he never did it. Yeah. So, you know, I think it's usual for guys to have turbulent relationships with the father. And that was my setup with my father. You know, he'd say, cut your hair and get a real job. Well, I've probably hinted I've had long hair for 45 years and I've never had a real job. I've never worked for anyone else. So my dad and I butted heads and. When I came to America as a 19-year-old, the goal was never to go back to, to England because mm. I didn't want to go back to that environment. Mm. And that represented failure for me. So when I met Karen in 94, you know, and we sort of formed together and grew together and we were together all the time. When she passed out of the blue, there'd been some issues, but it wasn't looking like someone has a terminal disease. Like my father was diagnosed with cancer in 2010 and passed away in 2012. He passed away when he was um, 72. But he wasn't active. You know, he'd sort of let life slip him by. Kind of the, I think that was what part of what motivated me to never give up was I'd seen my father give up at an early age, mm. and it didn't look good. Mm. And he didn't really have any goals. You know, he could have achieved stuff, but... He wasn't 100% committed and didn't put the energy in. So when my father passed away, it was sad, but I didn't have this great relationship with him. When Karen passed away, it was it was the end of the world, and I thought my life was over, and that part of my life was over. You know, I, I, I was 48 years old, and it was like just an end of that chapter. And then 18 months later, when I turned 50, I met Hannah, and that was the beginning of a second leaf on life, a second opportunity, a second chapter in my story. Turning 50 was kind of a big deal because people say it's just a number, but yeah, health became a thing, mental health and physical health so you can go running. And, you know, ironically, within six months of Karen passing away, one day I was on the Sixth Street Bridge, they closed it down, and I talk about it in the book. And But I'd go on these long, lonely walks and I hopped, the, the bridge was dark, they were just about to tear it down, and I hopped over the wall, and I hadn't anticipated the, the rise of the incline, when I dropped on the other side, it was like a 10-foot drop, and I felt like, oh, that didn't land well, I shouldn't have done that, and long story short, I kind of went undiagnosed, I'm walking around traveling, four months later, I can't walk in excruciating pain, I find out I had stress fracture cracks on both of my tibias, essentially broke both my legs, but I was still walking, but that put me in a wheelchair, for two months, and I think in a way it was, it was something out of my control that forced me to slow down and stop, because I hadn't stopped when she passed. I just sort of shifted gears and went in another direction. So I don't really know if there's an answer here other than you find a way, a way to deal with situations and adapt to that environment whether you plan it or like me being in a wheelchair for two months, you know, it's, it's a tough thing and everyone deals with it in a different way. And I don't feel there's any right and wrong way to deal with it. I don't know if that answers. It's a great the, answer. The question is, you know, the way I'm interpreting it is like, it's not going to be a 
all of a sudden a new paint job on a car, it's going to be part of your patina. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you just got to accept it. And it's I'm sucks. sitting here trying not to tear <laughs> up. It's sad. Uh, you know, and it's not going to be easy. But it's not going to be yeah, easy, yeah. but life goes on, and you, you just got to sort of keep moving forward. Yeah. Well, thank you for that answer. Magnus. No problem. Can I add to that conversation? Yeah, yeah, I know we've yeah. talked about in the past. Um, death is so hard, and it breaks my heart to hear um, everything that you went through. Um, obviously, it's no secret about my life, all the shit that I've gone through. But I will say you don't want to live with any regret. Um, I don't know. It, it's a tough one. And I think if you're questioning it, it might be worthwhile to at least have the conversation. You know, it's, so you yeah, don't question it I, I do feel like I'm in a, down where I am currently today, you know, if my dad passed away, I would have tons of regret. But, yeah, you know, we, we similar to you, like, you know, he's old school dude. And we just, it's like, you know, we have so many things to go over. But it's kind of irony of life is that you know, you he's passing start? away because of dementia. And he d doesn't even remember. Oh, <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's kind of like I started laughing. <laughs> yeah, no, I get it. Hey, Dad, you remember this? He's like, <laughs> I don't remember. I don't even know who you are, right? <laughs> Today, <laughs> right? So, you know, like, it's like, uh, it's like I just started laughing. My right? first <laughs> response to that, though, is for you, uh, even though he's not going to remember, you got to get it out, I think. Yeah. Uh, you know, because he's not going to remember it, but you're letting it go whilst he's still here. And second off that, after my dad passed, someone told me something because they had lost their father as well. I think it was almost a decade prior. He told me that not a single day had gone by that he hadn't thought of his dad. And that hit a chord because I was like, oh, shit. Does that mean I'm going to live the rest of my life thinking about the fact that my dad's died at least once every single day? And the sad truth is, yeah. I think at least once a day for my entire life, I've thought of him. And I share that because if you you don't, that's the, the regret, I think, is if you do find yourself thinking about it, at least in mine, since that's mine, everyone everyone's going to go through their own thing. Yeah. You don't want to have those thoughts of, should I have just had the conversation? Shoulda, coulda, woulda. Shoulda, yeah. coulda, woulda. Even if yeah. he's not relating to it, you're expressing your emotions and letting it out, whether he receives it or not, it's kind of irrelevant, I think, because you're going to let it go. Yeah. And it sounds like he's not going to be able to absorb it through the dementia, but I think you'll feel lighter that you said whatever it is you got to say. Yeah. I mean, it's, a, it's one of those, like, mountains that I look up and I go, I got to run that. And but you're doing it every day? Yeah, Baby go, steps. Yeah. yeah. And then... It's one step at a time. It, it, it's the thing that I do feel like at 51 today, like if I don't resolve this, this is something I'll carry with me for the rest yeah. of my life. And yeah. That's a lot of weight. Yeah. You said it yourself, your run is in four stages. Yeah. yeah. Gotta get, gotta you get to the bench do. first. Yeah. I yeah. think you know what you gotta do. Many times you know the answer, huh? And yeah. You just gotta, but I, you know, the good thing is that, you know, I, I have, I have a, my, my manager, I, I was like, talking to him like last week and he goes you know it's interesting because like you're so asian and i was like what what the, that's like is that a racist <laughs> thing and he's like no because you hold everything in like you don't you know the squeaky wheel gets the oil he's like it's he's like i'm not saying complain he's like you gotta like actually like talk yeah, yeah, yeah like you just hold everything in it's like you just try to take care of everything and then we don't know what, what you're going through that's kind of like the british right? thing as well keep calm carry on you know mm -hmm. we don't let it out you know it's but it's, it's not difficult. always healthy I no guess. for no. sure not no this is what i'm learning yeah, yeah. and that's something that I'm, I'm realizing i at least i'm willing to talk about it because yeah. then you know I, you know your point of reference is like it gives me courage like yeah right that's you're the first right step. you know it's like it's not something I should avoid, you know? Well, and if the conversation goes bad, it doesn't sound like he might remember it. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Sorry, dark joke. Which there you go. No, it's funny. Yeah, you guys can laugh at it You gotta be able to laugh at it. Because I was like, I was like, because I used to carry it, like it was like this bag of rocks, like of anger. Yeah. And I was like, and one day I'm gonna sit down with you <laughs> and I'm just gonna like throw the rocks at you. And then I was like, he ain't gonna even remember what, <laughs> what 
what I'm talking about. And I just started laughing. I was like, this is, you can't make this stuff up. No, 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 you can't <laughs> script it. Yeah. Right? This is not an act. This is like yeah. real, the real emotion coming out. Yeah. Right? I got one more yeah. story that's going to time real briefly. Cause okay. With my dad, I remember the last real time I spent with him, because he passed in 2012, it was probably the last time he came out to LA. So it's 2009, 2010. And we went on this madcap adventure to go check some, you know, barn find Porsches that we'd seen on Craigslist. You know, it became this all day journey. I remember we drove in my Irish Green 66 911. And we drove somewhere out to the Inland Empire to look at something. And it wasn't quite what it was supposed to be. And then the guy goes, No, you know, my buddy out near California City, has got like a bunch of cars in his backyard. So. We headed on this other journey. By the time we got back home, we only thought we were going for two hours. It had been like an eight-hour day. We'd driven like 300 miles. We'd looked at a pile of crap cars that weren't worth 500 bucks. We didn't buy anything. But we kind of had like this breakthrough moment of, I never spent eight hours in a car with my dad when I was driving, when he wasn't shouting at my mom for giving him the wrong directions or whatever it was. And it just sort of became this full circle moment of I guess we both realized at that point without saying sorry that we'd sort of resolve whatever issues mm. resentment anger whatever you know it's like yeah I never cut my hair never got a real job but we're doing okay here right That's so cool. mm. Vegas F1 you were there <laughs> thank you I Marcus. was there thank you yeah what's your take on Vegas seemed like pretty good to me I thought I thought it was great. I yeah. really had a great time. Uh, I found obviously it different from other races that I've been to because it felt like wherever you bought your tickets, you were kind of gridlocked. You right. couldn't walk the track or go explore. But I had a great time. I thought it was fun. I thought they put up a great event. Um, it was well organized. I'll say that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we were there. You know, I think everyone sort of thought it was going to be a shit show, and it wasn't. Well, everyone was like preemptively like talking shit, right. prepared for it right. to be, but. I mean, Vegas knows hospitality. It's one thing they do better than anywhere else in the world, right? Mm -hmm. You know, they made a couple of mistakes, but that was first time out. Yeah, and you gotta you gotta fail somehow to learn, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I thought the event was great. It looked spectacular, and uh, I say it was a win-win all around. Vegas. That's why you can't believe anything you read on the yeah. internet. Because it's funny because I'd see all these terrible things. I'm like, wait, I'm yeah. here right now. It's not like yeah, this. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> it's all because it was only negative like feedback. And then when I talked to you and talked to you and anybody went there, it was, like, it was great. Yeah. Vegas is, you're right. It's the hospitality town. Yeah, it was really, really cool. Huh. What are you guys looking forward to this year when it comes to car related stuff? Hmm. Did you go to King of Hammers and events like that? Did you, did you go there? No, I'll be going to Tokyo Auto Salon. Oh, okay. Wow. Have you been to Auto Salon? No, I've never been. I've been to Tokyo, but no, I'd love to go there. Hannah and I are off to a retro mobile in Paris. Ooh. Oh, cool. Coming up. We've gone there before. We're excited about that. We're going to go to Amelia Island. Have you ever gone there, the Concord? I have, yeah. So ironically, this is uh, I've been invited back to be a judge, which is kind of ironic. It's the third time. And I'm the guy that's always sort of saying, you know, I'm anti-car show. It's my pet peeve of people with white gloves and Q-tips judging your car and telling you what's right and wrong about it. But two years ago, I got invited to be a judge there, and it was great. I met Peter Brock. He's a legend. Uh, John Oates, legend. Ended up becoming friends with John Oates. He came down the warehouse. He's a big Porsche guy. Yeah, yeah. super yeah. cool, down-to-earth, mm. talented guy. So that, that was a great example of something that I'd sort of turned my nose up a little bit. But uh, I guess it's all about evolving and brought, like collaborating with other people. And you never mm. know, you know what opportunities mm. you know, that door opens. Like meeting John Oates and Peter Brock was a great, great opportunity. And uh, just like you say, meeting people through the car world. Yeah. You know, it doesn't surprise me what you said when we first sat down at all. Because mm. it's just organic. Like, that's what brings people pure motorheads, gearheads, whatever you want to call them, car people together is the joy of this 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 thing, right? You know, this you know, it's an appliance, right? But it's more than that. You know, it takes you on this journey. It's more than something that you commute and takes you on a journey from A to B. It opens up the world to sharing stories like we're doing here. It's hard to articulate to people that don't like cars why the connections work. Right. Mm -hmm. Right, it's like I, I don't know if it's like oh, it's like dog people. It's like if yeah, you have yeah, dogs, yeah. like instantly like oh, what kind of dog you yeah, have? Yeah, exactly. Like, oh, rawr, rawr. 
sure. And then it's like, hey, what do you do? Hey, what? you know, and it's that connective tissue. Mm -hmm. Cows and dogs go together right. for sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Your dog's really, really mellow. Yeah, yeah, he's a good boy. Does he run with you? Yeah. Uh, he runs on Fridays with me. Okay, okay. But he doesn't like Thursdays? No, it's like I'm worried. <laughs> I'm worried that he's as he gets older, he's gonna have some hip joint. problems. So okay. I don't want to mm -hmm. do this. So on Friday, he wants to come. Okay, okay. But you know, I, I take him for as soon as I run, um, either before or after, I take him on a long walk. Okay. But on Fridays, he gets to actually run with me, he, and he loves it. I do want it this year, and I, someone told me, gave me advice: don't tell people like your plans. Right? Yeah, just but do it. This is a a goal that I have. It's like I do want to do like a. Sounds to me like you're telling people you want to do it. Huh? Sounds to me yeah, like yeah, you're yeah. telling people you want to do well, it. I am gonna do. Oh, what are you gonna what do? You gonna do? do? Ultra. Ultra. Oh, an ultra. Which is like sixty, and then there's a hundred, and wow. there's two fifty. That's a long, long like, way. I'd like to do that. I'll like, be there cheering you on. You know you won't. It's like <laughs> but I won't nowhere. be running it. <laughs> I'll be on the finish line. That's a lot of steps. <laughs> yeah, lot of steps. yeah, I want to challenge. Like I want to fight. Fight yeah. through. Yeah. Got to break through. Yeah. You what do they call it? Win. The wall? Is that what they call it? The wall? Is that the wall? The marathon running when they break through the wall? No, no, what no. is that? The 18 mile marker? Yes. That's right. right. I think 18. it's the wall. Mm. But anyway. Get out and run. Yeah. But thank you, Magnus. This was Yeah. I really beautiful. appreciate you beautiful. coming was, by, coming was good on. Coming in. Appreciate yeah. the opportunity. <laughs>